Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast, helping you propel your writing business to a whole new level. And now, here's your host, Ed Gandia. Hey there, thank you for joining me for episode 111 of the High Income Business Writing Podcast. My name is Ed Gandia, and this is the podcast for business writers and copywriters who want to take their writing businesses to the six-figure level or the part-time equivalent. As a quick reminder, you can find detailed show notes for this episode by going to b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 111. You know, if I had to guess, I would say that most of us view freelancing as a way to make a living. And by that, I mean that we we think of it as a way to kind of pay our bills. Um, sure, it's doing work we enjoy and doing it on our own schedule and our own terms. But that's pretty much where it ends not for everybody, but for many of us. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are some professionals out there, some solo professionals, who look at freelancing a little differently. They see it as a means to fund exciting adventures or deep-seated passions. They choose this work model because it enables them to travel the world and create life-changing experiences or do something very specific. And it's all based on this whole idea or this other thing that they're really trying to accomplish or do or impact. These folks don't live to work. They really do work to live. And you can tell, you can tell this and you can see that and you can hear it when when they talk, you can just feel it. it. You just know it's a little different from maybe the way some of us approach the work. My guest this week is a great example of this mindset and approach to freelancing. His name is Kevin Casey. He is a freelance copywriter based in Australia who travels four to five months every year. You heard that right. This guy is out traveling four to five months out of the year away from home, and he uses his freelance income to fund every dollar of these experiences. I think it's just a it's a slightly different approach from the way many other people travel and see the world. And I think you'll notice um, the, that difference in, in, in why it's so important when you listen to Kevin speak. So listen, whether you enjoy traveling the world or not, I, I think you'll find Kevin's approach to work and leisure inspiring and thought-provoking. So let's go right to that conversation. Kevin, welcome to the show. So great to have you here. Thank you, Ed. So this has been a really hot topic, and obviously it's it's a top hot topic among uh, freelance writers, copywriters, people who kind of got into this because – they, they wanted to create a location-independent business. I mean, maybe that wasn't the sole reason, but that was definitely something that attracted them to the idea. And whether that meant, um, hey, I just want to be able to, you know, go up to uh, the mountains an hour north of here, um, you know, occasionally, or I want to travel the world, it was definitely an attractive idea. And that's something you've done really, really well, and I can't wait to, to dive into that. But before we get into uh, into that, why don't you tell us about yourself, the work you do the kind of clients you work with, a little bit about your background. Sure. Ed. Well, basically, I uh, I was born in, in the States, so I, I immigrated to Australia in 1991, and I I'm currently live or am based in Brisbane, in uh, Queensland, in the east coast of Australia. It's a lovely place to be. Uh, my background's a little bit different, I think, from, from many freelancers because I actually started out as a self-publisher of my own books back in 1992, and I wrote four print books, uh, and I it was very sporadic. I, I didn't, uh, you know, I, it was like six years between books. You know, it wasn't uh, I wasn't doing it full time or anything like that. It was kind of a kind of a hobby. And then fast forward to uh, about uh, late 2013, I was just working in a camping shop. I, I, you know, I wasn't really writing at all, and I was just thinking, you know, I, I really should. Uh, should put this this writing skill that I have to use and and give this whole freelance writing thing a shot. So I just uh, yeah started my own business straight away. Um, and the reason I did it, the main reason actually, is kind of funny because I have this hobby where I uh, traipse around the planet and I explore really remote rivers. 
And I've been doing this since I was in my late 20s. And uh, it's a really fun hobby, but it's darn expensive. Uh, it costs a lot of money to go to Gabon, West Africa, and hang out with the pygmies, pygmies for a month or, or go to Borneo and film orangutans or whatever it is. So that, believe it or not, was my 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 reason my goal for for starting the freelance writing business because i wanted something that would give me consistent earnings and be completely location independent and basically pay for all these cool trips that i wanted to go on wow <laughs> so yeah this is we're not talking about the uh, the typical hey i want to uh you know, go to the, the Hamptons, you know, for a bus. You're, you're <laughs> going, you're going remote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I could just, just to, uh, to talk about, I guess, a typical year for me, there, there really is no such thing as a typical year for me, but, uh, what I got up to just in the last 12, 12, 15 months, I guess, uh, this time last year, I was in the jungles of Bolivia for a month. I was uh, tracking jaguars and mountain lions along riverbanks. And then in, um, Let's see, October, I was uh, swimming and snorkeling with manta rays on the Great Barrier Reef for a week. Then in January, I had a couple of weeks uh, driving around Tasmania. Uh, what was next? Let me think. Hard to, keep, uh, hard to keep track sometimes. Oh, yeah, May, I was in uh, – um, I did digital nomading, but I, I do it in a kind of a – a part-time way. I'm not – you know, I have a base in, in Australia here, but I, I can take off and go – pretty much wherever I want, whenever I want, for as long as I want, which is the cool thing about what I do. But I went to uh, to play Digital Nomad in a place called Cordoba uh, in Argentina, and I did that for five weeks, and that was pretty fun. Just got a, an Airbnb apartment uh, set up there. I had, uh, I think the, the whole cost of the trip was a little over $4,000. Uh, but I actually invoiced nearly seven thousand dollars worth of work, so I had a lovely five week holiday and actually made a profit, <laughs> and uh, had a wonderful time in Argentina. And then um, I think the last trip I did, uh, I only just got back uh, about a month and a half ago from uh, Spain, the southern co coast of Portugal, which is amazingly beautiful, and a little bit of time in Milan, Italy. So that's my travels. Wow. During the past 12 months. Yeah. That is fantastic. So uh, what I'm hearing here is there's really no uh, necessarily a, a pattern or right. You're just uh, you, how, tell us what goes into making these decisions and then how long you will go for. Or how do you make that decision? Sure. Well, it all all depends uh, on the work that I have going. I, I I can, I have some, so I'm very lucky. I have some, some excellent clients who are quite understanding and they understand that I, I do like to just take off for a month at a time. And you know, not all clients, as you know, are quite that cooperative. <laughs> they, they don't necessarily let you do that, but I have some, some really excellent clients who, you know, I just give them a, a couple of months notice. I say, you know, I'll, I'll be gone for all of June or, or, you know, um, a part of January and a bit of February and I'll be back and you can, you know, hit me up with, uh, with double the work if you like. Uh, so, so, you know, it keeps them happy, but lets me do the things that I want to do. And, and essentially, you know, we all have our, our priorities of, of what we're trying to get out of freelance writing or, or copywriting. And, uh, for me, like I always like, like to use, uh, the legendary Bob Lye, um, as, as a good example of, of, you know, here's a guy who has been working, I think by his own admission, something like five hours a day of, or sorry, five, five days a week, 12 hours a day for something like 34 years now. He's a bit of a workaholic and he, do, he does amazing work and he's, he loves what he does. Obviously he loves writing, but for me, that's not, you know, really what I want to do. I don't want to work as hard as Bob, Bob Bly does and, and, and be just all about the work and the money. For me, I have to have, I have to have a lot of variety in my life, as you've, as you've heard. And uh, I like the idea of using um, copywriting as a, a, I call it a means to an end profession, because it's, it's really something that no matter what your lifestyle is, if you're a stay at home parent and you can only work an hour and a half a day or something, uh, you know, that's fine. If there's, if you want to really crank out the work and, and make, make a six figure income or, or work toward that. Uh, that's cool. For me, the, the main priority is to make enough money to do all the really crazy trips that I like to do during the course of the year. So that's my, my thing. So if I make, you know, a lot of people ask is, is, uh, 
is a six-figure income what you're working for? And for me, I say, well, no, not really. <laughs> uh, I just want to make enough to, to pay for my trips, to do good work, to keep clients happy. Um, and not, not all of my trips are, are you know, hardcore, extreme wilderness expeditions. I, I, I do normal touristy things like everybody else. But I guess the difference with me is that instead of having one two-week vacation a year or something like that, I can have half a dozen vacations a year plus a couple of river trips and maybe, you know, weekends away and then fit all of that into my existing client base and the work that I have. So on average, what would you say? And I'm sure it varies year to year, but do you have a goal that you try to meet in terms of how many weeks off? Uh, at the moment, I'm probably working seven to eight months out of the year and traveling four to five months. But having said that, sometimes I will take the laptop with me when I go overseas, as, as I went to Argentina. That was, I probably worked just as hard in Argentina as what I do at home. And then when I went to Spain and Portugal, I was starting my new uh, blog, The Jet Setting Copywriter, and uh, working there. But, you know, when you go to places like uh, uh, the Cook Islands in the middle of Pacific or Bolivia, you, there's not much point in taking your laptop with you. You're just really uh, going to, to do what you want to do and forgetting about writing for a while, which is also, you know, I think it's, it's important. A lot of people, they, they work a bit too hard at it, I think. And it's, uh, you know, for me, it's important to get away from it and just clear my brain of, of writing entirely for, for three or four weeks at a time. So walk me through, and, and we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of how you do that, how you make it happen, especially when you do take your laptop with you and you know you're going to have to do some work out there. But um, give me an idea of how you make travel decisions, destination decisions. So walk me through you know, uh, how you were kind of collecting ideas of places you'd like to visit. Do you do this kind of at the end of the year and planning for next year? Is it very ad hoc? Walk us through that process. Okay. Well, I basically have, I guess, three different types of trips that I do during the year. I have like uh, what I call playing digital nomad, where I, I will just uh, pick a, a city usually and there are certain cities that digital nomads like more than others because they're inexpensive to stay in. Uh, you know, there's like Chiang, Chiang Mai in Thailand is just huge at the moment. It seems, uh, it seems like half the digital nomads on the planet are living in, in Thailand at the moment. But I, I tend to go for uh, different sort of places that are not, I guess, digital nomad hotspots as such. But uh, so I have digital nomad cities basically that I go to just to to test it out, and it's just usually a matter of uh, getting a an apartment for a month, or a month and a half, uh, setting up, making sure you've got decent Wi-Fi, and uh, you know doing a bit of work because you know it's just you can do work uh, pretty much anywhere in the country as long as you've got your laptop, you've got a PayPal account so people can pay you, you've got some semi-reliable Wi-Fi working, uh, you can you can make money. So it doesn't really matter. So there's those trips. Then well, and by I the way, to, I never heard of that term digital nomad. That's, that, that's Oh, that's really? Okay. Thing. Well, that's that's been a, a huge thing for, uh, I guess, 10 years. It's getting more and more popular. It's, it's basically, it's another term for location independence. Um, but I think there's a, there's a fairly distinct difference between the two. A, dig, a lot of people who call themselves digital nomads actually don't make a huge amount of money. They only make just enough money to stay in only the cheapest destinations on earth. And these are places, places where you find a lot of these people, uh, Thailand, uh, the Philippines, uh, Prague is fairly inexpensive, certain parts of uh, Central and South America where you can manage to find cheap accommodation, decent Wi-Fi, and, and everything like that. But... Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different terms for, for what people like myself do. Location independent entrepreneur is one. There's, there's, you know, half a dozen different labels, and none of them really are completely adequate, I guess. Yeah. Because uh, especially for, you know, somebody like me, there, there's no label for what I do. It's just it's totally different from, from anything. Uh, but I, I also have perfectly normal vacations, um, like, like everybody else. That's my other type of trip. Like when I went to Spain and Portugal, just got back uh, end of uh, last month, actually. Uh, and then I have my hardcore, serious, 
uh, remote river expeditions. Now, I've been doing this for a quarter of a century, and uh, I've been to, oh boy, everywhere. I've been to Africa, Borneo, South America numerous times, probably explored uh, seven or eight rivers in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, just a few years ago, I went by helicopter to a very remote area in Northern Australia to uh, explore a river that was so remote you you couldn't get in there any other way except by chopper and the river was uh, completely unknown like it it didn't even have a name that's how <laughs> that's how in the middle of nowhere it was so that's so those crazy. are my three yeah three types of trips that I do and uh, I try to balance it out you know I, I try to get at least one good solid serious river trip in every year if I can uh, this one I guess my last one was in Bolivia and in Bolivia was was incredible because it's it's not only the cheapest country in South America to travel in, but the wildlife is is just unreal. We we were uh, I had an indigenous indigenous guide with me, and we were uh, just walking along riverbanks, and you'd see tracks of uh, you know the rarest animals, animals that that people that have lived in South America all their lives don't even see: giant armadillos, tapirs, uh, you know, jaguars, all sorts of wild cats. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That is awesome. And how long are those trips typically, the hardcore ones? I generally try to make them about a month between, uh, yeah, four, four to five weeks is fairly typical for those guys. Okay. And those are obviously, you know, you're off the grid. You're not really working. Uh, yep. The digital nomad trip is, is sounds like that's a working trip typically. Yep. Yep. And a normal vacation um, is that a mix? Sometimes you're working, sometimes you're not, or is it typically exactly. a real vacation? Exactly. Well, when I was in uh, Cordoba in Argentina, I basically had accumulated a, a ton of work. I had a, a client uh, insurance company, actually, and they, they wanted something like 41 articles uh, in three weeks. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I didn't see as much of the countryside as I wanted to on that one because I was just kind of glued to the computer. But uh, when I was in Spain and Portugal, that was a bit of a mix because uh, I had just started up my jet setting copywriter blog and I had the ebook out and all of that was happening. And I was trying to get that finalized and, and sorted out before I got home. So that was, you know, kind of token two days a week work. It wasn't terribly difficult. It was just whenever I felt like it, if I wasn't doing something else, I'd crank out the laptop and, and do a bit of work. Now, how fluid do you have to be scheduling wise? Are, are you uh, planning at a high level early in the year or are you playing it by ear throughout the year based on the work that you're getting and that, that you have planned out? Yeah, it's pretty much a it, it's not planned too much. Uh, I, I usually try to uh, well, it, it all has to start with the work. You know, obviously, if the work's not there, I don't have the money to do what I want to do. So it's I've got to. The work is is 100 100% the priority of what I'm doing. Uh, the travel happens if the work is going along the way I want it to. So I have at any given time, uh, you know, sometimes I only have two clients going at once. Sometimes I might have seven or eight. Uh, I tend to. I'm very. For, I have been very fortunate in that I've been able to get clients who are uh, steady work, long term type of clients, as opposed to one-off projects. I tend to try to try to avoid those when I can. And I think that's been one of the secrets of my success in that I've been able to get clients that I can rely on month after month. To give you an example, um, when I first started uh, copywriting, I, what was that, about 2013, and I had no idea. I didn't know, you know, how to start, what to do, how to find clients, you know, totally, you know, I'd, I'd written books and I, so I knew I could write, I knew I could make money from writing, but I hadn't done freelance web writing at all, not one. And so unfortunately, like many new newbie writers, I uh, wasted a bit of time with content mills and a couple of job boards and all those, what I call dead end <laughs> um, ways of getting writing. Uh, and I, you know, quickly realized that I, there was no way I was going to make a sustainable living writing for, you know, six cents a word or whatever it was. So I quickly ditched that, that whole segment of, of, of copywriting possibilities and started to pursue my own clients. And, and essentially, uh, 
built a writer website, extremely basic writer website. And I mean, most web designers, if they look at my website, they burst out laughing. That's how, how no frills it is. It's, it's pretty basic. Uh, so I did that. And then I joined LinkedIn, which was, I think, one of the more crucial steps that I took because I was able to get uh, some pretty good LinkedIn contacts. And then I started cold emailing them and that kind of snowball. But my, my first major client, funnily enough, I was actually um, sitting on a park bench in uh, Lake Bled in Slovenia, of all places. Wow. And I had emailed some LinkedIn contacts, didn't hear too much back. So I think, oh, I'll just go to have a holiday in Slovenia and Austria and see what happens. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I get an email and these people uh, say, yeah, well, it's a financial services company. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a try. Well, fast forward 18, 19 months, and I'm still writing for these guys. They gave me probably, I was making between three and a half thousand to up to $8,000 a month just from that one client, uh, all from just a cold email that I sent to a LinkedIn contact. So that, that was just pretty darn lucky. You know, you, ha you have to be grateful for what you get, and that was a good one. And then I just added, you know, other other uh, types of clients onto there. There was a nonprofit that wanted their whole website fixed up. So I did that for a few months. There was a, uh, funnily uh, enough, you don't really need to, uh, to know about what you're writing about with some situations because I had a, a software company and an app development company here in Australia, uh, very fast growing, huge company. They've expanded into Silicon Valley and all sorts of places, but they, had actually the CEO of this company had seen a message that I'd I'd replied to some somebody's question on LinkedIn completely random, and he'd seen that and he liked my answer and he thought, oh, okay, uh, we'll we'll see see how you go. So I was writing about app development. Now I have never even owned a mobile phone until about six months ago, <laughs> so I have no idea about apps. I didn't know a thing about apps, but I wrote for six months all about. Um, app development, which was a huge learning curve. I don't know if you've, I assume you've probably written for software companies and, and those sorts of things. And as you know, they have their, their own language. It's nothing like English. Uh, yes. <laughs> they have their own world, you know, but uh, so I had to learn that. But uh, yeah, that, that's basically how I got my start. I, 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 I used LinkedIn and then I realized that, that cold emailing was a very effective method, at least for me. And so I, I did it, started doing it outside of LinkedIn, just uh, collecting, you know, lists of particular types of companies and target markets that I wanted to go after and cold emailing them. And it all snowballed from there. So I, I basically got to the stage where uh, I had to be turning down work six months after I started freelancing. I, I basically went from zero clients. Uh, this is probably what early 2014, I went from zero clients to making seven grand a month within five months or so. so That's was, fantastic. Yeah. It is wonderful. And uh, just a, a, a great uh, testament to the power of um, cold emailing, what I like to call warm email prospecting. So guys, you know how you hear me harp on this all the time. Yeah. Here's further proof. I, I did <laughs> not talk to Kevin about this before the interview. Uh, this is, well, it's, uh, it's funny, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of different ways you can get clients and, and some ways are, you know, not as fun as others. I mean, I actually uh, tried cold calling as well. I had a little cold calling experiment early in my career because I'd, I'd read Peter Bowerman's excellent book and he, you know, how he recommends cold calling as a, oh, yeah. a vi viable way to do it. And I thought, well, I, I wasn't really convinced, but I'll give it a try and see, see if it works. So I ended up, uh, uh, making, uh, I was aiming for 40 calls a day for, for 10 working days. So two weeks, basically, uh, I got a bit lazy on the last day. So I only, I only did 371 calls, but that's still a lot. Uh, but out of my 371 phone calls, I got about 40 pretty solid leads. And of those 40 leads, I got 14 paying clients. So I worked it out statistically, mathematically that it was, one out of every 26 or 27 phone calls, I would get a paying client. So it is a numbers game, like, like emailing as well. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not the most thrilling activity on the planet, sitting there with your phone and calling up strangers. But, uh, you know, if somebody is desperate for clients, they're just starting out, they can't get anywhere, and they're just, you know, wondering where the heck the work's going to come from, 
uh, get on the phone. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a wonderful, thrilling thing to do, but it does, it does give you work eventually. So this is uh, interview is not about this, but since you mentioned it, if real quick, uh, what what worked for you in terms of an approach or script? Because one out of twenty seven for cold calling is not bad at all. Yeah, I um, well, I I think that the first and and most important thing is to not use a scattergun approach where you're just opening the phone book and you know picking businesses out of the book. You've got to to have a pretty good idea of the types of people you want to write for and the, you know, I had a pretty good idea that, you know, there's some businesses that obviously are going to need copywriters or freelance writers more than others. So you target those, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I, I like to, uh, to go after digital marketing managers. Those, those are, those are pretty good folks to, to try to get, um, I haven't really got into working for agencies. I, I, I have nothing against it, and maybe one day I'll I'll experiment with that. But I haven't really needed to, so I tend to go directly for clients. But as far as an actual script, I think I did write something down, and it roughly follows, you know, what Peter Bauman says. You know, you introduce yourself, you make sure that they have time to talk to you, because obviously, you know, some people they're just so busy that it, it's better if you call them back later. It's you know you don't want to push it. Just give them give them a chance to hang up if they need need to do some work. But uh, tell them what you do. Make sure you mention your your website so they can check it out. Uh, just basically ask them if um, if they have any needs for uh, for freelancing work and and stress that you're you're not desperate for work. You know that you're actually it's all about helping them. It's all about you know, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What, you know, are you swamped with, with writing tasks at the moment? You need, you know, somebody to take the load off sort of thing. So it's, it's all about making sure it's, it's, uh, it's, it's helping them out. And, you know, I, I don't really have a specific script. I kind of wing it depending on how the person sounds and how busy they sound. And, and you know, it varies. Gotcha. Okay. Well, hey, it's uh, congratulations because that's uh, that's that's very impressive, and obviously you're not afraid to hustle, and that's served you very well. Now, m moving, uh, kind of getting back on the on the whole travel thing. I'm curious about one thing before we get into. Well, this is kind of a nuts and bolts question, but uh, you you mentioned that you fund your trips using the work you land. And you, yes. you look at the work and, and the financial reward from that work, the compensation as a way to fund your lifestyle. Right. So, but there's still kind of a fixed cost of living where you are today. So you have to cover your basic costs that happen no matter what, right? Your rent in Australia sure. and, yep. and other costs that are fixed. So um, wh what have you done to kind of make those as low as possible so that you're, you're able to have that surplus to, to travel with. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the, the most important thing is that my mortgage is, is paid off already. Uh, a lot of people don't have their mortgage paid off. So, um, I'm, I'm a person who doesn't really use credit cards. I know that's a, a shocking revelation for people in this century, but I, I've never had any credit card debt in my life. Uh, I don't really use credit cards. If I can't afford something, if I don't have the money in the bank, I don't buy it. That's <laughs> that's my my first philosophy. Mm -hmm. But uh, my house is paid off. My cars are paid off. I really only have the only expenses I really have at the moment are, uh, you know, basic electricity, food, normal everyday living expenses. Um, and funnily enough, a lot of people are under the illusion that when you travel. It's actually a lot more expensive than staying at home. But I find that traveling sometimes can be cheaper. Like if I work out the monthly expense of, of say, a month in, in, uh, in Portugal or wherever it is, it can actually be cheaper than my month's expenses at home. So I guess for me, um, I like the idea of living below my means rather than above my means. So that's, it's just a philosophy of, of not buying a lot of extra junk that you don't need. You know, we don't really need a jet ski in the garage and we don't need a lot of the stuff that we buy is kind of discretionary. Don't really need it sort of stuff. So that's, that's my, my philosophy uh, of life. And, and when I look at the amount of money I'm taking in for the year, like what the, I think the first year, uh, just giving you rough rough estimates. The first year of freelancing, I think I made around forty thousand, give or take. 
uh, and probably 80% of that went straight to airfares and, and overseas trips. So I didn't, I don't have a lot of huge overhead at home. So that's, that's, you know, obviously that's very fortunate for me. And I, I realize a lot of people don't have that, that situation. They've got, you know, they've got three kids and they've got mortgages and they've got credit cards to pay off and they got two cards to two cars to pay off. But, um, so a lot of, you know, the vast majority of the money I make fortunately goes into my traveling adventures. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. You know, don't, don't spend too much. I mean, it's, you know, if the less you spend, the less you have to have to make. Sure. Sure. And I'm assuming, it, well, I assume that you didn't have any kids, but, uh, you're not married or, you know, in a relationship where you have to consider someone else and, um, uh, right. To, to help you make some of these travel decisions. So you're making all the decisions yourself. Well, I am making the decision, uh, decisions myself, but I actually am married and do have a couple of boys, but the boys are grown up now. Uh, so they, they, uh, I'm not uh, having to stock the fridge for, for teenage boys anymore, which is a, a huge, <laughs> um, yeah, cut in expenses. But, uh, I have a very understanding wife who lets me, uh, uh, pretty much, you know, do whatever trip she, that I feel I need to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, that helps a lot. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, and, and I think the the thing that people miss and here I've learned this from just talking to other folks like yourself who just make this stuff work is that the the idea is not to take it to an extreme if that's not what you want to do. Uh, right. Everyone's got a place they, they want to fit in this scale and it's a sliding scale and it depends on where, you know, where, where you want to take it. But you know, me with a couple of kids, um, they, I, I, I would consider a version of this that would work for me. So I don't think this is a, you know, a yes or no decision. It's more of a, you know, where do you want to fall in, in the spectrum? I mean, would you agree exactly. with that? I would agree with that completely. And to, to my mind, one of the huge, huge, wonderful advantages of freelance writing, copywriting as a profession is that is it is so flexible you can do whatever you want with it you can you can you know stay at home and work work really really hard and and you know make it all about just the income and making the money you can make it about uh you know having a side hobby while you know you you, you can keep a full-time job if you want and just write a couple of hours a, a week you can make it about uh, traveling the world as I do and, and having it finance your, your dream. So I sort of put the, the work, my life doesn't revolve around the work. The work is made to fit in with the lifestyle that I had before I was a freelance writer, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into the day-to-day -day stuff uh, in terms of how you make this work. Um, and specifically on the trips where you are working. So tell me about what kind of practices and habits you get into, what your schedule looks like um, sure. in terms of communications with your client, you know, how you make that work. Because I know that's a big question for people who want to try this. Sure. Well, I think, you know, technology has made all of this so much easier than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We have, we have Skype and we've got, you know, uh, communication uh, programs like Basecamp and, you know, all sorts of things like that. I essentially, uh, I have an Asus uh, laptop with a solid state hard drive, which is pretty robust and you can, you know, throw it around a bit as you're traveling and it, it doesn't break on you. Uh, I have a, a little Wi-Fi booster that I take along because sometimes the wireless connections in, in different countries aren't so wonderful. So anything you can do to crank those up a bit is always great. I have a PayPal account. That's how I get paid uh, for most overseas clients. And um, direct deposit, a lot of people use that. I just give them the bank, bank account details. They can throw the money straight in there. Uh, my normal MO is to go to a country. Uh, I usually use Air, Airbnb to find an apartment. I don't stay in hotels and go to touristy areas. I basically am in a normal local neighborhood somewhere. I like to be up above ground level so you don't have quite as much traffic noise. You can concentrate on what you're doing and just set up there. And uh, most of my clients don't even know that I've left the country. So, and, and they don't care, to be honest. Uh, like if you're producing good work, your clients are happy, you're happy. Uh, they don't care if you're in 
Botswana or you're sitting at home in your living room. So uh, I communicate with clients uh, probably 95% of the time with standard email. Uh, use Skype now and then, not that often. I've actually only had one client meeting in the last three years, which was on a beach <laughs> in, in Queensland, Australia. So I don't really do meetings. I think they're, they're mostly completely unnecessary. If you ask the right questions of clients at the beginning, you know exactly what they want. You, you understand their expectations. And I'm, I'm pretty good at, at vetting or pre-screening my clients. I don't, uh, I'm fairly picky about the clients that I work for uh, because, you know, my experience has been that if you if you really latch on to a good client, they're worth their weight in gold, and you start to learn to sort of detect the signs that a client might be a really awesome client or maybe a not so wonderful client, and and I've got pretty good at that. So in, in yeah, and, and I mean I'm with you. These these are tips and this is advice that I, I think everyone should apply, even if you're not traveling, right? So the, the whole meeting sure. thing, the communications, um, it shouldn't really matter where you are. Um, what has worked for you in terms of a schedule and maintaining discipline? I know for me, when I travel and I'm out for an extended period of time, um, and I know it's going to be a bit of a working vacation, um, I, I, I have to set some sort of uh, time constraints because yeah. otherwise the, the work kind of spills over. Um, yeah. and, and even then I, I do find myself uh, sometimes dreading that. So um, how do you make sure that this stuff actually gets done? And, and, and then also the leisure part uh, gets yep. done as well. Sure. Well, I am uh, as bad a procrastinator as any writer, and especially when you're, you know, if you're sitting somewhere and you look out your window and there's some beautiful beach there, it's it's kind of hard to get motivated sometimes. So you do have to have a, a plan in place. And I, I'm not much of a morning person, but if I have a lot of work on, uh, I'll get up whatever hour I have to get up to do it. But I, I have a, a little mental trick that I do because probably – most of the time, I'm actually setting my own deadlines in conjunction with the client, but I, I basically am the person who decides how quickly the work is going to get done. And I find that it's absolutely essential, at least for me, to set a deadline maybe just slightly quicker than I would like it to be in order to give me that impetus and that, uh, that focus to really get the job done. Because if you, if you, if you get all sort of vague with your deadlines, it just does not work. You have to, you have to uh, crank it in and make sure that you know you've you've set a deadline. That means you're gonna gonna have to go to work, and you you don't have a choice. You know, so it's basically you're kind of putting yourself in prison and taking away your your choice of of you know being able to go to the beach or or whatever. You have to set your own deadline in such a way that it forces you to do the work that needs to get done. That makes sense. I, I think uh, <laughs> we're all kind of deadline-driven creatures, so I can see how that would be very effective. Do you find that it? Um, I know there's a lot of tension for me sometimes, even with a deadline, where I, I just feel like I need to get it done, and I find myself not enjoying um, the, the sights that day. For instance, if I, you know, we're yep. out traveling that afternoon, yep. how do you separate the two? How do you make sure you stay present uh, when you're out traveling? It's, yeah, it, it's not easy. It's not easy because, you know, for me, the, the ideal situation is to, to get up, do your work, uh, finish it, whatever it is, two, uh, 2 p.m. or 4 p.m. or, you know, even if, if you have to work straight through till 7 p.m. and, uh, you know, get it done so you can stop thinking about it and enjoy uh, the sights. Now, there's times when, you know, if I'm in a place where I know that it's just going to be so awesome and I'm going to want to get out and see the sights every day, I will actually intentionally make the deadline uh, slower so that I know that I've I've left space and time in my schedule to to get out and do that. But, you know, you don't always have that luxury. When I was in, Ar in Argentina, I had, you know, 40 something insurance articles to, to get through in, in two and a half weeks or whatever. So I was basically... Uh, working pretty much all day like a normal nine to five person, go out for dinner, uh, see some friends, whatever, and come back and do it the next day. So that's, you know, it's not all, you know, 
sitting on the beach with your in your hammock with your laptop and your mai tai. It's there, there's you know you have to work just as hard sometimes when you're overseas, if if not more so because you have more distractions and things. So it, it, it's a tricky balance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that so I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> oh no. Um. So I guess wrapping up. I mean, what have been some of the biggest surprises for you uh, now that you've been doing this for a few years and you've been funding these adventures with, with your freelance work, any, anything that maybe some people might, might find surprising or, or just interesting that we haven't covered. Um, I would say the main shock to me was when I decided to ditch the content mill and the, the kind of the bottom of the barrel jobs and the job boards and all of that. And, and basically said, no, nah, not going to do that anymore and started pursuing my own clients, uh, how quickly it actually snowballed and how many great clients are out there and how much work was out there when you go after the specific target markets that you want to write for. And I, you know, I don't really have a niche uh, as such. I, I do a lot of outdoor, you know, outdoor adventure type articles and I can write about that. Um, I, I did 18 months of insurance writing, so I'm pretty good at that. But I'm, I'm quite happy to do, you know, any writing that anybody wants to do. And I think for me, uh, I have a certain, you know, when you're a guy who swims with crocodiles and eats piranhas for dinner, you don't really, you're not really afraid of, of, of clients, you know, <laughs> that much. It's like it's <laughs> negotiations and, and that sort of stuff that I think, you know, a lot of people are very wary of and they don't really like to do it. That doesn't bother me at all. I'm quite happy to, to do that. But I guess the biggest surprise would just just how much how much work is out there. I had a guy who who runs a software company in Australia. This guy's worth, you know, 50 plus million dollars. His business is absolutely massive. And he actually said to me, you know, I find it very hard to find a good copywriter these days. And a lot of people are shocked by that because they're they're working for, you know, their 10 cents a word or something and and wondering where this good work is. And it's just you have to you have to look in the right places. And I think uh, once I learned how to to look in the right places, it, it just got so so much easier. I'm glad you said that because I tell you, and I, I, we've all been here, right? When you're on the other side of things, when things haven't happened for you in your business yet, or let's say you're coming out of a dry spell, that just doesn't seem possible. It doesn't exactly. seem possible that there are clients out there desperately looking for a good writer or copywriter. Oh, it's just, it's, it's amazing. You know, and I've, I've talked to other writers who are starting out and they're, they're really struggling and they just cannot find, you know, the right clients. And, and they just flat out don't believe that somebody can make 50,000, 70,000, a hundred thousand a year reasonably. I wouldn't say effortless, effortlessly, but you know, fairly easily. Um, they just don't believe it. You know, they, they actually think you're lying to them when you say, yeah, I made, you know, 65, whatever thousand dollars this year. And I only worked eight months out of the year. They think, ah, come on, <laughs> but it's, it's true. You just have to find the, the good, steady, long-term clients that really value what you do. Uh, you know, I've even had clients, I had a client who gave me a raise when I didn't even ask for it. They said, oh, we think we should pay, you know, pay you a bit more per word or whatever. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing, people don't believe that either, that people will give you more money than what you ask for. Uh, but if you're doing good work, you know, it's, uh, it happens. Wow. Well, Kevin, this is uh, not only is this inspiring, but I, we got into some things that I wasn't expecting to get into, and I'm glad you cover them. It's, it's all important stuff. Um, before we leave, though, where can listeners learn more about you and tell us about your blog? Sure. I, I have a, a blog called The Jet Setting Copywriter, and uh, you can just find that at www.thejetsettingcopywriter.com. And you'll also find that there's an ebook on there, which goes by the exact same name, The Jet Setting Copywriter, How to Fund All Your Overseas Adventures Through Freelance Writing, which is what I've been doing for years. And it's a load of fun. It, <laughs> Yeah, I, I love I love the message you have here, right? Make money, explore the world, which is basically what we covered today is how to look at it differently and and make uh, your your freelance work really the the funding source 
for uh, for these adventures. So that's yeah, fantastic. just basically control your own destiny, whatever destiny that is that you want to to work toward. You know, not everybody wants to uh, to track jaguars in in Bolivia. Uh, there's lots of things you can do with the money you make as a freelance uh, writer, but uh, whatever it is that you want to do, it's a really good profession to to help you work toward your goals. Well, I tell you, definitely don't want to do the jaguar thing, but I wouldn't <laughs> mind eating piranha. Just, just so I could say I did it. So <laughs> it's it's always better it's always better to uh, to catch and eat the piranhas before they catch and eat you. That's my philosophy. I think that's wise, <laughs> Kevin. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this with us. Thank you, Ed, and thank you for all your work you're doing for for writers. Uh, I've been a fan of yours for for some years now, and really love what you're doing to help writers get uh, get where they want to be. Wow! Thanks, Kevin. The High Income Business Writing Podcast is a production of B2B Business Launcher. Learn more at b2blauncher.com.